During the panel portion of this session, you'll be able to submit questions for panelists through the chat by directing them to ask questions here. And you may also use the chat to direct any technical issues you may be experiencing. This session is not designed to dig into each and every line of the budget, as that is fairly impossible. However, if you have specific questions on the budget analysis presented at the start of today's event that are not answered, or that you cannot find the answer to in our budget analysis report, you can also put them in the chat and we will endeavor to provide clarity or answers as we can through a follow-up email that you will receive in the coming days. Now to the main event. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to one of our newest team members, our research manager, Kirsten Boda. Kirsten has a wide range of experience in the nonprofit sector, including frontline service delivery, stakeholder engagement, and facilitation, change management, evaluation, and of course, research. She has done the painstaking work of combing through the budgets and business plans to make sense of what this all means for the sector. Welcome, Kirsten, over to you. Thanks, Karen. I told Karen I wanted a really good introduction, so she went above and beyond for that one. <laughs> awesome. Well, yes, like Karen said, my name's Kirsten, and I'm the newest member at CCVO, and very excited to be presenting this to you today, and I'm just so excited at the turnout because it just shows that there's a lot of people out there that care about the budget and what's happening in the sector and us nerds out here are not alone. Um, so let's just dive right into it because uh, there's lots to talk about. So um, this first slide, we're going to talk more about um, government priorities in relation to the sector. But before I start, I just want to reiterate what Karen said, that this is a really high level overview of the budget analysis. So think of it as a teaser. Um, and any questions you have or heavy thinking, really go to the budget, look at it, reach out if you have questions, because there is so much to know about the budget. There's so much analysis that can be done that that's really what this is here for, is to um, kind of start that conversation and, and for us as a sector to really be a part of that. Um, so with that said, um, jumping into this budget. So in the budget, the gov government of Alberta has articulated kind of three key priority areas, which are enhancing government services now and for the future, growing Alberta's economy and fiscal sustainability. And of course, those all sound great. Um, but when it comes down to it, um, while this budget projects a surplus, our analysis really shows that it doesn't recognize the importance of community recovery or really identify the nonprofit sector as a leader in that effort with any new major investments. Instead, we're seeing investments being made into recovery centered on job creation and diversification, which of course are great things. But when it comes to the sector, the focus is really on debt elimination and, and maintaining status quo. And I think when I was reading through the fiscal plan, what really stood out to me was this one quote, just kind of buried in there that said, until the debt is eliminated, resources will continue to be used to pay interest costs rather than being directed to delivering the important government programs and services that Albertans rely on. Um, yeah, so that kind of set the tone for a bit more of the analysis there. Um, but when we move into the next slide, we can actually start to look into the change in expense by ministry. So when we first looked at that really high level across all ministries, there were lots of fluctuations in expense, but really the average percent change in that budgeted expense um, from the 2021-22 budget to the estimated expense in the 2022-23 budget was just 2%. Um, and then we also looked more specifically across what we call those key ministries that are related to the nonprofit sector. And this percent change was just 1%, which is what's shown on that table there on the slide. Um, you will notice maybe that children's services isn't included. That was because um, that substantial increase uh, to the ministry really came from that federal funding through the new Canada Alberta Early Learning Child Care Agreement. Um, and so we didn't want to kind of throw off the whole analysis by having that outlier. So while we're looking at changes at the ministry level, it can kind of start to give us a little bit of that indi indication of where those investments are going, um, which is minimal. It's important to show where those specific increases and decreases are made within the ministries by program to help you better understand the impact of this budget on the sector overall, because we all kind of that's what we're looking for is those line items and programs that our, um, our nonprofits and our organizations draw from. 
So in the next slide, we'll just dive more into some notable program increases. Um, so the, the, this slide shows the increases within programs within those key ministries. Um, it shows you kind of the breakdown into each program within the ministry, and hopefully some of these programs will sound familiar to you or the line item, because these are where some of your funding has come from in the past. Um, so as you can see, child care goes to child care affordability and access, child care quality and worker supports. But again, a lot of that is due to that federal funding. Employment and income support goes to career and employment services, which aligns with that priority of um, kind of that job creation and, and um, yeah, job creation that we've heard over and over. But again, um, despite this increase here, when you're looking at different line items, there's actually an overall decrease to employment and income support due to reductions in other parts of the budget. And so we'll talk about those later in the decreases. Um, assured income for the severely handicapped goes to program planning and delivery. Disability services goes to supports to persons with disabilities. Heritage goes to program support. Cultural industries goes to program planning and delivery. So a lot of that kind of um, how we're delivering programs and that type of thing is where the funds are being targeted on those increases. And then capital grants in culture and status of women goes to community and voluntary support services and then the Community Facility Enhancement Program, or CFEP. Um, but it's really important to note that despite the increase that's happening here, there's actually a large decrease in the line item for status of women um, that kind of offsets these costs a little bit. Parks goes to operations, emissions management goes to technology innovation and emission reductions. Alberta senior, but Seniors Benefit goes directly to the Supplementary Accommodations Benefit and housing goes to assistance to Alberta Social Housing Corporation. But again, at the same time, capital payments for assistance to the Alberta Social Housing Corporation were decreased by 50%. So kind of offsetting that increase again. It's nice to look at these increases because when we're looking at investments or where money is being shifted into certain programs related to the nonprofit sector, it could signal a bit of opportunity for organizations that work in these areas to find ways to partner with the government, uh, receive funding from the government in the upcoming fiscal year. So these are areas to kind of watch for how the money will be spent in community. Now we'll turn over to notable program decreases. So on the flip side of those increases that we uh, read about, there's all these decreases that are happening at the same time, but they're happening in different line items. So it can be a bit difficult to track those changes and know how it really filters down to your programs. Um, so the average decrease across the programs within the ministries was about 11.4%. Um, there were decreases in the early intervention services for children and youth due to decreases in the youth in transition program. And like I stated earlier, employment and income support is actually seeing um, decreases to program planning and support, income support to people expected to work or working, income support to people with barriers to full employment. And then the other one I mentioned earlier was community and voluntary support services. Those de decreases are due to the program support, community engagement, and the Community Initiatives Fund, or SIP. And then cultural industries is due to decrease in that Alberta Media Fund, and fish and wildlife is due to decreases to fisheries management. So I'm hoping as I've read through a bit of those, uh, it's a reminder of, you know, oh, that's a program we've applied for, that's something we've worked through, that's something we rely on, and, and then this can kind of give you a pathway to kind of figuring out, okay, what does this mean for our organization and, and how do we fit into that? Um, so in the next slide, um, we did it. I'll just give a quick overview of the analysis of investments into those key ministries. But if you go into that detailed analysis, you'll be able to see um, even uh, the percent change and the dollar change for any program that's in there um, and kind of be able to compare those against each other. Um, so overall, despite the increases presented, the funding adjustments are negated by other cuts and some rearrangement of funding, leaving the nonprofit sector to fend for itself with limited resources. Um, the budget seems to signal a continuation of this attitude that the nonprofit sector doesn't play an important role in recovery in this province, and that it's expected to continue operating with stable or even decreased budgets in the foreseeable future. 
Um, another thing that's important to think about in the budget is that even though we have these increases and decreases in programs, it's not connected to very specific programmatic details to those line items. So it's hard to know how does this funding actually flow out to the community. So for example, a programmatic announcement that was recently made was um, around the youth in transition service delivery model chains and some funding that's involved in that. And the way it's communicated is, you know, this funding is coming out, that type of thing. This is what it's going towards. But when we actually dive into the budget and look at the line items, we can see this program has actually experienced a reduction in funding. So it's really important to contextualize yourself in that overall budget and pay attention to those announcements moving forward into this fiscal year um, in how you advocate, how you have conversations, but also in, you know, the opportunities to apply for things and, um, and just to be aware of kind of what resources are available to you. So I would really encourage you to read that deeper analysis to better understand where specific investments are being made or not made, and then watch for those programmatic announcements through the Government of Alberta website so that you can understand what it means for your organization. So then in addition to looking kind of at the uh, key ministry programs, we also looked at CCVO key priority areas for investment. So if we move into the next slide, um, yeah, we can see that there are five key investment areas. So these were the key priority investment areas that CCVO submitted as a pre-budget submission asking for investment in a community recovery fund. So the submission identified these areas for investment to support the nonprofit sector, both within organizations themselves and then into the communities that they serve. So there were five areas, general community recovery, equity, diversity, and inclusion, youth engagement, mental health, and digital transformation. And um, beyond just these five areas, we went into specific recommendations for investments um, focused on ways that the government can work in partnership with the nonprofit sector to advance the goals of community and economic recovery. So when we move into the next slide, you can kind of see a high level view of our analysis of investments made by these priority areas. I realize that I've broken the rule and this is a slide filled with lots of information, um, but I really wanted to just be able to give a high level view. I won't go over each of the recommendations that were made, but if you look on this slide on the, um, in the middle column, those are the recommendations that were made in each of the priority areas. And then on the right under status, it shows, you know, what, progress has been made pretty much on investments specifically based on that recommendation. And really um, the point in putting in this table and putting it up there is to show that there's been very little progress made into those priority investment areas. So it's just another way to look at the budget and based on kind of the needs of the nonprofit sector and supporting um, the sector as a whole. So if you wanna go in and read about those, um, feel free. We have lots of information about how the budget um, may, does or does not meet those priority areas and the investments that we recommended. And then um, for the final slide, we'll talk a bit about moving forward because it's a bit of, it feels a bit heavy to talk about the budget and um, kind of the feelings coming out of this budget of, oh, there's no investments. That's a big statement. So um, of course, We've said it over and over, this budget does not make any new major investments into the nonprofit sector. So we need to be ready um, to be expected to fit into other programs and services that are available. And I don't think I need to say it, but I will say it that um, we'll be competed to fund for, compete for funding using valuable resources against others that are not the same as us. So larger corporations, private organizations, that type of thing, um, because there's not these like tailored investments into the sector that really meet the needs that we're seeing. Um, and then, uh, like I said, we'll need to continue to operate with reduced or unchanged funding amounts in, in many of these areas outside of potentially those investments that I talked about that are being made. And this is all happening while continuing to deliver high quality support to individuals and communities to meet the growing needs of Albertans and their families and in the context of a global pandemic. So while this analysis provides some information, I'm sure the budget raises lots of different questions that we have, but um, pretty much the pro 
programmatic ways that this will come forward and how we can, as a sector, advocate for um, those programs that need to happen and how they fit within the budget that's been outlined. So moving forward, like I said, I'll continue us, well, we will continue to encourage you to watch for those program announcements regarding the funding and different programs happening in your communities. Um, you can subscribe to those emails through the government of Alberta and, and they'll make those announcements there. You can um, watch for those announcements through the CCVO newsletter because we also put them out there for the sector for everyone to see and just try to kind of increase that knowledge of what's going on. But I think really, as um, Karen said in her last blog post um, for the nonprofit vote, investments that benefit the economy and those that benefit the community really are not interchangeable. They're both required to create a prosperous province. For Alberta's economy to recover, we must invest in both community recovery and, and, and economic recovery. And so um, CCVO as an organization plans to continue to advocate for this by asking for investments in social infrastructure to support that community recovery um, that will also be in partnership with that economic recovery that um, is being focused on right now. So like Karen said, the link to the full budget analysis is in the chat and it can also be found on our website. You can always reach out to us at CCVO. We love to hear from you, your thoughts, kind of things that are going on for you based on this budget analysis on the policy team. And uh, I look forward to kind of hearing the panelists and see what's going on. So with that, I will turn it back over to Karen. Thanks, Kirsten. I have to wait to be unmuted. There's a ghost in the machine and I accidentally muted myself. So there we go. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kirsten. And uh, as Kirsten said, in the link in the chat is the budget report that you can find detailed information about um, shifts by dollar amount or by percentage amount in programs that you may be applying for that have supported you now or could potentially support you in the future. And if you have questions about that report, the, um, you are welcome to put them in the chat and we will make those questions and potentially the response if it's something that we know the answer to uh, available in the email that gets distributed to all attendees at today's session after the session is concluded. So we invite you to do that. Um, I am really excited for this uh, next portion, which is today's panel discussion. And I can tell you, even just in the green room, uh, before we started the session today, uh, panelists were chatting about uh, the announcement today about the cooperation between NDP and Liberal governments at the federal level, and it was already very interesting. I learned a bunch of stuff in the five minutes in the green room, and I think we're going to learn a lot more as we chat today. So joining me to talk all things budget, leadership review, election, potentially more, wherever they want to go, these guys can talk about almost anything. Um, they have an incredibly deep pool of knowledge and experience to draw from. So let me introduce our wonderful panel today, starting with Michelle Hines Dawson, Vice President, Community and Digital Engagement Association Services, YMCA Alberta. Michelle brings 15 years of issue management, stakeholder relations, and community engagement experience to the team at the Y of Northern Alberta. And prior to joining the Y, Michelle lent her skills to a variety of provincial government ministries and agencies across three provinces, having achieved a master's of public relations from Mount St. Vincent University and a certificate of change leadership for Cornell University. Michelle is a self-proclaimed lifelong learner. Welcome, Michelle. Um, Diane Kenyon, consultant focused on strategy, leadership, engagement, and public affairs. Diane has spent more than 30 years providing counsel, leading teams, and developing complex initiatives to enhance reputation, engagement, and support for organizations, ideas, and communities she is passionate about. Prior to consulting, Diane was Vice President University Relations at the University of Calgary, and held leadership roles at Ryerson University, CBC, Radio Canada, and the Royal Ontario Museum. She is a lifelong advocate for the nonprofit sector, arts and culture, and building great communities. Welcome, Diane. Nahad Nenchi, a community builder with the Ascend Group. So strange to introduce you this way. <laughs> 
I feel like this man needs no introduction. However, here I go. <laughs> Ned served as Calgary mayor for three terms between 2010 and 2021, where he was awarded the World Mayor Prize as the best mayor in the world in 2014 by the City Mayor's Foundation. He's also received the President's Award from the Canadian Institute of Planners and Humanitarian Award from the Canadian Psychological Association for his contribution to community mental health. McLean's Magazine once called him the second most influential person in Canada, right after the Prime Minister, much to the amusement of his mother. Prior to his election, Nah had served as the Canada's first tenure professor of nonprofit management at the Bishop School of Business at Mount Royal University. Nahad is a graduate of the University of Calgary, where he served as president of the Students' Union and holds a master's of public policy degree from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, where he studied as a Kennedy Fellow. Welcome, Nahad. <laughs> and last, but by no means least, Bob Wyatt. Bob has been executive director of the Mutart Foundation since 1989. And prior to that, his career was in public and government relations in the public and private sectors. For much of the last 25 years, he has been extensively involved in issues of public policy, particularly those that relate to the regulation of charities. The involvement includes serving as the co-chair of the joint regulatory table of the Voluntary Sector Initiative, a federal government move to improve the relationship between government and voluntary organizations. Anyone remember that? I sure do. And he lectures annually on policy issues and on government issues at Carleton's University Masters of Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership Program. He's the co-editor of two books, one dealing with regulation of charities, and more recently, one outlining the history of and issues within Canada's charitable sector. He's been awarded the Alberta Centennial Medal and the Queen's D Diamond Jubilee Medal for service to the sector and in 2017 was awarded an honorary doctorate of laws degree by Carleton University for his leadership and stewardship of Canada's charities and public benefit nonprofits. Welcome, Bob. What a heavy hitting panel. So happy to have you all here. I'm going to dive in. We're going to do um, a first question around round table question and Bob, I'm gonna start with you if I can. So what does this budget mean for the nonprofit sector? Um, it means that we're going to have to make do with the same or less. Um, the, the reality is that the status quo and this budget is very much a status quo budget um, is a decreased budget. Uh, and just, just by way of giving you comparison, uh, Jeff Braun, our director of policy, did some, did some research. And he went back to 2006, so 15 years ago, 16 years ago. And he looked at CFEP and Community Investment Program. In 2006, if we adjusted just for inflation, not allowing for population, sorry, allowing for population growth too, this year's allocation would have been $70 million. Instead, we have $38.5 million. Uh, in CIP, if we had done the current inflation and growth, we would have had $58 million. Instead, we're getting $20.7 million. So the sector has been hurt badly by not accounting for, for growth and inflation. And in the last two years, what I hear from social service charities is the increased complexity of issues that clients are presenting with. <clears throat> um, the pandemic has affected the citizenry, that there's no debate about that, but we aren't being given the resources to try to get people back to recovery. And it's not clear to me how some of the other goals um, that are set out in the budget are, um, are going to happen without us being able to get the citizen rate back to a pre-pandemic situation. Yeah. The reality though is that this is a budget that has only one date in mind. This is an, a budget for April the 9th mm -hmm. um, and the leadership review in the, in the UCP. Uh, it is a message to the base and reinforced almost exactly the party's platform from the 2019 election. 
<clears throat> I, I, th I think there, um, people have called it a political budget. I don't know that, and, and my colleagues on the panel may disagree. I don't know that it's any more political than any other budget. There are certain, certain areas where one option has been preferred over another. So the UCP wants um, addiction recovery. The NDP wants harm reduction. Is either one of those things wrong? No, they're both good things, uh, but we've sort of polarized it. And, and I guess that's one of the pieces. I, I think once again, the budget and the rhetoric around the budget is polarizing issues and creating an environment within which we have to work uh -huh. And that polarization makes it more difficult. And uh, no doubt. And uh, is there anything that we're not seeing that you might have been expecting, given the sort of political nature of, of this particular budget? I was surprised that there was um, not more discussion of continuing care. I mean, I think if we learned anything in the early days of, of the pandemic, it's that we've we, Canada, has a mess in the field of continuing care and seniors, seniors accommodation. Um, there's talk about new spaces. It's not clear how those new spaces are going to be created, whether we're in fact increasing spaces or flipping private spaces into public spaces. It's not clear where we're going to get the workforce <clears throat> to accommodate that. And it's not clear what the government's position is on the federal government discussion about setting new standards for seniors care in, in Canada. Uh, we know that um, in Alberta, we love to trash the federal government. Um, and so this we're just setting up another fight, I think. Um, I guess the other thing that I might have expected to see, I was surprised that they didn't move back to indexation of, of some of the benefits. I thought, you know, they, they'd held off. And as we move closer to the red zone, uh, where, where courageous decisions are not going to be made as we get closer to a, the next provincial election, I would have expected that might have been around. The other thing that I'm not surprised I didn't see, but I'm disappointed I didn't see, is you'll recall that um, at the time of the much referred to McKinnon report, um, the government said in the last year of its mandate, it would start looking at the revenue side. I saw no reference in the uh, in the budget to Dr. McKinnon or anyone else starting to look at the revenue side. Instead, we're, we're going to rely on, on the price of oil. And many of us have been on this roller coaster once or twice. Um, and I'm hopeful that that this time will be different. But You'll forgive me if I'm a little cynical about that. Yeah, we have a, a way of um, going back to look forward a little bit here. Thank you, Bob. And Diane, maybe I'll, I'll go to you. Uh, what does this budget mean for the nonprofit sector from, from your perspective? Well, I would generally agree with Bob's points. I would make a few other observations. First of all, I think because there is no investment in the nonprofit sector overall, it's extremely easy for everyone to lose hope. And I think it's really important that we don't do that. Um, you know, it's been a tough couple of years. Everyone is exhausted coming out of COVID. Um, we know that uh, staffing issues, retaining staff, attracting staff, in the nonprofit sector across the country and in Alberta is a huge issue right now. Um, and so I think that it's really important that we work collaboratively and do what we can and, and, and really not lose hope. Um, a couple of points. Uh, first of all, there is huge change happening in the world right now. So April 9th is coming up and this is a budget for April 9th, but there's a whole lot of stuff happening in our world right now that is gonna affect this, that we don't really have a clue where it's going. So first of all, we've got a war in Europe that's creating global instability and it will affect us in Alberta and we don't know what that's gonna look like. COVID seems to be on the decline, um, but who knows where that is gonna go. 
So there's just so much instability right now. And I think that we need to look at this budget from a, from a broad perspective, as well as the detail, but, and, and think about um, what we can do collectively to look at creating a voice for the nonprofit sector. Um, there are some bright points in this budget, others may disagree with me, but you know, children's services is certainly one of them. I know that there's been a lot of concern in the sector about the details of this budget of the child service agreement with the federal government, and we don't know what all the details are yet. Um, but um, the fact is that they've done this deal with the federal government and money is coming into the province. And we'll see what the federal deal looks like that was just announced today around dental and pharma and housing but it is potentially a good thing, even if we don't like every detail, it is a very good thing that the government is able to bring more money uh, into the province. Um, you know, a couple of things that really struck me about this budget. The first is that I couldn't find any reference at all to diversity and inclusion mentioned in the fiscal plan. Now I may have missed it, but I couldn't find that at all. And um, equity isn't mentioned and I think this really speaks volumes about this government and its um, and its it's what we are seeing in terms of divisiveness being increased rather than being addressed. And so I think when we talk about what we do going forward, this is something that we really need to keep a lens on. Um, the other thing that really struck me, and um, Bob referenced this, is that there is really no, it's not just that there's no money in this budget, new money in this budget to address the frontline needs of the, of the, of the not-for-profit sector. Um, there's also no money in the budget to address capacity building and transformation in the sector. And I think that's a huge issue that we really need to be talking about and thinking about because as we see these budgets decrease year over year over year over year in real dollars, we really need to be thinking about how we are working differently. And I know everyone is thinking about it, but it is really hard to think about it when everyone is exhausted and everyone is working so hard just to meet the frontline needs of people in Alberta. So I think that the degree to which we think about what we do with this budget, and again, who knows what the world is gonna look like in three weeks, I really think we need to be speaking as a sector together in one voice as much as possible to try to get to the big person's table, right? So, um, so I think that the, the sector is, this budget reinforces the fact that the sector is thought of as over here. So there's sort of the big person's table, jobs, economy, innovation, economic recovery, and the nonprofit sector is not at that table. And I think that we need to be thinking, I know everyone thinks about it, and Karen, you and CCVO and Gemma and ECVO, and so many people in the sector wake up every day thinking about this. But to me, this budget says we need to really double down our efforts to really think about how we address the systems and holistic level together in a collaborative way. Let me, let me ask you, Diane, if you're um, amongst the client work that you do, if you're seeing advocacy that is tractioning with this government, I mean, it's very difficult political climate to advocate for anything that doesn't sort of fulfill the, the needs of the upcoming leadership review or, or the government direction. So are you seeing tractionable advocacy in any pockets? I think that it's really hard to do unless you can demonstrate how it completely and directly aligns to what the government has framed as, as, uh, as economic recovery. Yeah. And unless you can demonstrate that, I think it's really hard. It's not impossible. I'm an optimist. I'm, I, you know, to me, not, there's always opportunity but it's really, really tough right now. And I think with this government, one of the real um, one of the really important points that I have discovered is that the rural and small town voice, and most people on the call will know this, is really important for this government, um, much more so than most. And so the degree to which you're able to bring the rural and small town voice to the table to advocate for whatever your particular issue is, I think makes a huge, huge difference for this government. Yeah, indeed. We've definitely worked with, with partners on that as well. Thanks, Diane. Um, 
Nahed, I'd love to hear from you about what you think this budget is meaning for, for us as a sector. Sure, I'll be very brief because I think my colleagues on the panel have raised all of the key issues. Um, I will, however, disagree just a teensy bit with the esteemed Dr. Wyatt um, on the politicalness of this budget. All budgets are political. But usually budgets also have a sense of policy, of priorities um, within that. And this budget didn't really have any of that. It didn't have a roadmap or a direction as to where the government is attempting to go. It was, oh my gosh, there's a lot of money. Uh, let's figure out what to do here. And it's about April 9th. It's about the next election. It's about saying, look, we brought in a balanced budget. I don't think Albertans actually care about a balanced budget. I don't think that's the highest issue in people's minds. And I think that may have been the error here, rather than investments in what really matters. It wasn't until well after the budget that the premier promulgated this new principle. There's lots of P's in everything I'm saying today that surpluses should go towards debt reduction and investing in the heritage fund. Something I agree with, by the way, I think that's correct as well, as long as you have a well-funded basic level of services. Um, but it wasn't really part of the budget or the budget speeches. It's really make it up as you go along, depending on which audience you're listening to. And for me, that's a challenge. And I don't need to tell anyone in this room that a stand pat budget in an environment of 5.1% overall inflation, plus extraordinary wage and labor force pressures, even in a period of high unemployment. You know, those of you who were around in the uh, mid to late 1970s will recognize the beginnings of stagflation, high unemployment unemployment and high inflation at the same time, which isn't supposed to happen, according to Econ 201. Um, but given that, given that we're in that environment, a budget that doesn't actually make any choices or make any decisions, I don't think serves Albertans as well as one that does, even if you disagree with the choices. Yeah, and do you think, so from from a from your past experience, do you think that the what was available for municipalities in this budget has any chance to sort of advance or, or impact nonprofit sectors in, inside cities? I don't think so. I don't, th it was very stand pat, right? So you're likely not going to see, well, you're obviously not going to see increases in the cost shared portion of FCSS, for example, um, from the municipalities. Um, in arts and culture, the city of Calgary and the new leadership there have been very clear that they are maintaining the doubling of the investment that we did in the last term. So these things are good. Your, your, your city is clearly on your side here. Well, if you live in Calgary or Edmonton, I can't say too much about uh, all the other cities just because I'm not, I'm actually not following it that closely anymore. <laughs> um, but in Calgary and Edmonton, you certainly have city administrations, mayor and council, who are absolutely on your side. So they'll do everything they can to prevent really negative impacts, but you're not going to see huge investments either. And in particular, you're likely not going to see huge investments on the capital side. Um, the one thing I'm really interested in about today's announcement in federally is a re-upping of the Rapid Housing Initiative, which is something that was designed here in Alberta with Mayor Iveson and, my and, our, and me and our staffs. So there may well be a good investment in housing, but you'll notice there was a cut in the capital side of the Alberta Social Housing uh, Corporation in this budget. And this is what this government has done a lot of. Um, you know, they didn't, they basically didn't spend a penny on COVID response because everything they got from the federal government, they passed through good for them, but then didn't match it or add to it. It's one of the reasons why the budget looks so rosy. So I anticipate we're going to see a lot more of that. And, you know, uh, Michelle will say, I'm sure can speak a lot more to whether we think there's going to be any provincial money in the child care agreement. Um, but even if we go through with pharmacare and dental care and housing, I don't see this province jumping to the gun to fix it. One thing happened post-election, which actually might say that I'm a liar about this, which is right after the post-budget, I should say, right after the budget, the provincial government did in fact match the money the federal government had put on the table for transit operating support, emergency transit operating support, because it's $79 million. It was a big number. And when I questioned uh, members of cabinet about that, they said, well, we're never leaving federal money on the table and that one required a match. So that may be an interesting strategy going forward in terms of speaking to the municipal and federal governments. Thank you. And we've seen that at CCBO as well, a little bit of traction when we say 
Alberta needs to be more competitive for federal pockets of money, that there's there's some interest in, in helping to support that to make that happen. So I appreciate that. Um, Michelle, let's let's go to you. Uh, anything more to add on what this budget means for the nonprofit sector um, from your perspective? Yeah, it's hard to go last. <laughs> that was really no, not really much to add in terms of you know what it means. But I, I one thing we haven't really touched on is what it means for uh, how what's next for us in terms of how do we act? How do we, to your point, Diane, how do we remain hopeful and how do we keep moving forward? Because if it's one thing the charitable sector does really well, we keep moving forward and we keep making an impact. And so, you know, I think as we look to the uh, to the budget, you know, there's a lot of hints in terms of, you know, the tone, the packaging, the positioning where the government, what the government's thinking right now. I completely agree. There wasn't a, a it wasn't a policy driven budget. So for me, that leaves the door open to say, OK, who are the experts? Who are they going to be listening to? when they help create and take a budget to a policy? And how do we get to the table? Um, the budget also gave us an indication on what industries are really the focus. You know, lots of talk about the, the energy sector and other sectors like that. So, you know, I would encourage charities to look within our, our boards, you know, our donor groups. Who do we have that we can help, you know, help get us to the table to help be a, open a door for us to have a voice? We don't necessarily always do that. We try to often go on, you know, the great work that our organizations do, which certainly does have value, but that might not be enough right now. Um, the other piece of this, I think, is, and certainly as we look to uh, April 9th, is this is a real time of unpredictability and instability. Um, and so the media, uh, other stakeholders, and as well as, um, you know, staffers within their government, they're looking for that stable voice of expertise. And so I think it's really important to be speaking often and be speaking loud right now, um, especially in the media. Because, you know, as governments are fighting and leaders are battling uh, for positions, how can we as uh, experts in the community come in and really lend a voice and be that stable sense of calm um, to be able to, um, to really dictate and put some of our issues on the table? Um, you know, so I guess that's what, that's what I would look to, you know, in terms of what it means for us. It might mean us needing to be a bit more strategic uh, and creative to really make sure we're we're staying a part of the conversation moving forward. Thanks, and can you expand a little bit on that opening to take a budget to policy? So what what can I, if I'm sitting inside a nonprofit organization and I'm seeing labor shortage and I'm seeing pressures, um, I know you mentioned, you know, engaging your board and trying to be the person that provides the expertise for this government at this time. What other kind of practical things might organizations start thinking about around that? Well, it's really taking the, the budget from uh, a number, an investment line to actual how it's going to be spent and how it's going to be uh, used uh, within the province. You know, this this government, especially there's tends to be very little in budgets and um, and there's a lot more in press conferences, <laughs> you know, they, there's lots of news conferences, but in, in that, that's when you have all the details of actually how the money's actually going to be spent and, and who's going to benefit and who's not going to benefit. So it's, it's almost more important to be at the table to help define what the policy looks like, what the actual spending looks like, or the grant program, you know, whatever, whatever the case might be. And so like now's the time, especially if we see chunks of, uh, and Kristen mentioned this in her piece, um, you know, a good example was there was a lot of small business grants and, and uh, benefits with WCB during uh, COVID. Um, and that wasn't specifically for the charitable sector. That was for small businesses. But I know like for, for my organization in particular, we advocated quite hard for us to be included in that. Um, and, you know, and that allowed us to obviously to have a financial uptick, which was really important. So it, it's important to be at the table beforehand, but then it's also important as these policies come out and these guidelines come out to say, hey, you know, you didn't, you said small business, does that also include charitable and be putting pressures on to be asking those sorts of questions? Because they're not, obviously, the reality is, is they're not including the charitable sector as this is an important sector the same way they would be doing like with the energy sector. So how do we make sure we're saying, well, but that includes us too, right? Um, and I, you know, as a former 
press secretary for ministers. I don't think there's a minister in the world that would go, oh, no, 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 that doesn't include charities. That's just for business. Um, so you're able to kind of play into that a little bit. Um, you know, the other piece of this, and, and Diane mentioned it, but um, this particular government really loves social media and some of that public pressure. And so being able to counter some of that to make sure that uh, the charitable sector is being considered, I think it, it's important. It's it's kind of really understanding the game they're playing and and, and making sure we're we're playing that game as well and being and, and being really good at that game. That's an excellent point. And we know um, through our research here at CCBO that only 30% of Alberta's recovery programs were actually eligible for nonprofits to access. Mm. So out of all the recovery spend, the, the number of programs you had to to um, respond for recovery for nonprofits was only 30% of that total. And of course, we've seen big investments in labor market, in, um, in helping remove barriers for people seeking employment. And so we will be watching closely to make sure that nonprofits are at the front of thinking around eligibility for those kinds of supports as we move forward. So really great points. Thanks so much, Michelle. I will remind people if you have questions for the panelists, um, this is the chance to pick the brains of these uh, really wonderful and wise people. So please drop them directly in the chat and I'll make sure that they get asked over to our panelists. And I'll also say, because we've talked a little bit about advocacy, that um, we actually have a central platform to advocate for the nonprofit sector here in Alberta called the Nonprofit Vote. So it's nonprofitvote.ca. And there's a campaign running on that platform right now, um, which supports community recovery fund. So if you if you feel fired up and, and you want to let um, your MLA know that this is important to you, uh, we're making it easy over on the nonprofit vote, which also has blogs, opinions and other policy pieces. So there's my plug for the nonprofit vote. Um, please check it out. Um, maybe I'll just. Sorry, yeah, can, I, can I make a couple of points following up on, on things that Michelle and, and Nahid said? Go so, ahead, Bob. So number one is, um, Nahid said quite rightly, Edmonton and Calgary are continuing to match um, the, the FCSS funding and top it off. I think we need to watch very clearly what funding to municipalities looks like going forward. Because I think that the ability of municipalities to continue doing things like that in the wake of reduced government funding, new charges, the potential of a provincial police force, which plays to the base, except the municipalities don't wanna pay the additional money involved, could have significant implications. Municipalities continue to be a significant funder of the sector. And to the extent that they don't have the money, they're not gonna be able to do that. So I think that's another, key ministry we need to be watching at. The, um, in, in terms of Michelle's talking about policy, I absolutely agree with what she said. And, and one of the comments that, that Jeff Braun has put in my head is, we have to learn to be bilingual and arguably trilingual in the next little while, because we do have an election that is 14 months away. Um, we've got the... Uh, we have to bring in policy positions that can withstand a change in government and, and indicate, I mean, at this point, all political parties are looking at, will this win me votes or will it lose me votes? And we have to bear that in mind as we take things forward. Without telling them how to do politics, we have to know that that's a question they're being asked. <clears throat> My final point is that no matter what happens on April 9th, Cabinet is going to be distracted from now until the fall, at least. If the Premier gets a resounding vote of confidence on April the 9th, there is every likelihood that there will be a new opposition party appearing in Alberta. That's going to be distracting. If he doesn't, and a leadership convention is triggered, presumably any Cabinet Minister who becomes a candidate will step down from the cabinet position. And we will have a bunch of acting ministers who may or may not want to make decisions. So the rest of this year is going to be significantly challenging 
And then we've only got five months before and, a, and another budget before we face an election. So it's going to be a very uncertain time for the next 15 months. I think you raise a really good point because so, you know, who do we focus on during that time? It's likely voters, right? Because that's really who's going to drive, you know, what some of these platforms look like. You know, and I will say, you know, to be self-criticizing, we don't always in the charitable sector necessarily make our issues really important to kind of the general population or the general voter. And so, you know, getting back to your point, Diane, and working together and collaborate, collaborating, how do we really make sure that some of, you know, the, the importance of the charitable sector and recovery and the economy and all of those sorts of things, it's really on the lips of voters. Um, because you're right, I think you kind of go into that zone where nothing gets done on the, on the government side. So what can we do publicly? And what can we do with officials? I mean, there are a number of things, changes we can get done that don't require legislation or even involve a ministerial sign off. Sorry. We can get policies changed through officials. And, and, you know, it's, we spend more time wanting to have a meeting with the minister. And I keep being reminded of, of Ron Atkey, who was a, a very effective federal government legislator who, who kept saying, a meeting with the minister is the last gasp of a failed public policy campaign. Mm. Thanks, and Nahad, I'll see if maybe you wanna jump in here about what we should be thinking about in the run up to the provincial election. Sure, and I've had a question, Karen, that I'm gonna ask you, which is what's the best way for people to get their questions in? Should they just put them in the chat or? Yes, you can um, drop them in the chat and you can drop them uh, to questions for panelists, send them to questions for panelists. So when you click on the chat, you have technical issues and questions for panelists. So select questions for panelists and drop them in and we'll, we'll get them. And I have a few I'll get to here. There we go. <laughs> I'm muted and unmuted. Um, the only thing I'll add on this advocacy question, because I think um, Michelle and Bob have really covered this well, and Di this Di is something Diane knows a lot about, but I would just be very careful to make sure that we are framing our issues in a way that matters not to us as the sector, but to the community that we serve. That's the critical thing. And when we use language like we have to be more active or they need to understand our issues, we just have to be a bit careful to make sure that they understand this is not to help the Center for Voluntary Organization, the Chamber for Voluntary Organizations. It's to help the 120,000 Albertans who have ABCD. And I think that that is really critical. So the thing about this government is that uh, politely I'll say, it has found itself, and I shouldn't say it because there's just one person in this government, just the premier. So he has found himself to be remarkably intellectually flexible, depending on the last thing he heard. Um, and that may or may not be a good or a bad thing. Ralph Klein was exactly the same way. I had the chance today to listen to uh, Senator Paul Simons give a lecture, which was awesome. Um, you should check it out when it's recorded. But she was talking about same-sex marriage and how Ralph Klein was entirely influenced by the letter writing campaign of people who were against same sex marriage. Because he read those letters and said, you people are horrible. And I had no idea gay Albertans were facing people like you. And so in any case, um, really appealing, not just small business and oil and gas, that, that helps, but sometimes it feels a bit fake, but actually appealing to the real humanity to say, look, now that we are not in as terrible a financial situation, we can afford to index age benefits in 5.1% inflation. Tell those stories, help people understand the folks that are being hurt in the community uh, and how relatively modest investments from the government can actually make extraordinary difference to people's lives. And, and I think you'd be surprised at how much they actually will listen. Thank you, that's excellent advice. And, and, and we're hoping to, walk that talk as well as we move forward into the election at CCVO. There's a few questions here and we're, we're going to go to 315 today so we get a little bit more time on the clock. So maybe I'll just um, start with uh, one, Diane, there's um, was a question, you used the phrase the small town voice and so maybe just expand on that. What 
what is that? Why is it important politically? Why is it important when we're talking about budgets? Um, and how do you define that? That's a very good question. <laughs> Um, I think that what I mean by a small town voice, and I should say I have never lived in a small town. So, you know, to be really clear, um, I think that this, when, it, it, when you look at this particular government and you look at where their base is politically, that's really the key to this, that they want to hear, and I have been in government meetings where this exact language has been used. You know, it's really important to us to hear the small town voice. It's really important to us to hear the rural voice. And I think that the gut for this government, they value the perspectives and the opinions of uh, people who do not live in the urban centers, they believe that there is a very, that these people bring these people, it's, that's a terrible way of putting it, that the citizens um, outside of Calgary and Edmonton bring a very different perspective that has often not been heard and that um, they want to hear from them on any kind of issue. And it's very important, I believe it's important to this government that they do not they do not believe that they are hearing just Calgary and Edmonton voices. Um, and I think it's always been, and I know that it's always been important in Alberta, but I think for this government, it's even more important. And, and I would also agree with what Michelle said that, you know, the degree to which you're able to bring forward volunteers and community leaders and really the voices of Albertans rather than the voices of the staff of the organizations is also very very helpful uh -huh. thank you anyone else want to want to jump in or expand on that that's really helpful diane thank you at, at some point and i'm i always say this because i live in a land of eternal optimism but the latest census showed that the majority of calgarians live in calgary edmonton and red deer or majority of albertans live in calgary edmonton and red deer and at some point at some point it will dawn on the government that they cannot win the election without winning Calgary. Edmonton is sort of a lost cause. Mm -hmm. So as much as they want to appeal to their base or who they think their base is, it's not actually their base. There are 28 seats in the city of Calgary. And government after government, I've had six premiers since I was mayor and three different political parties. None of them seem to get that math. Yeah. Um, but in this next election, there's going to be four battlegrounds, not three. It's going to be Calgary, there's going to be Edmonton, there's going to be mid-sized cities, and there's going to be pure rural Alberta. And because the mid-sized cities, Mary Barry Morishita, who's the head of the Alberta party, is very well known in that field. He's really recruiting good candidates. So it's going to be a different game. So given that, you know, I totally agree with you that they're listening to the wrong people and they're alienating who ought to be their base maybe they'll finally figure it out and figure out how to do basic math. Um, but again, three political parties, six premiers, none of them did figure it out. Yeah. Uh, hopefully they will someday. It does raise a good collaboration opportunity though. Like yeah. I know, yes. like from our organization, we're in Red Deer, Edmonton, Grand Prairie and Wood Buffalo. And so it has been really helpful to be able to speak to, yeah, this is, childcare is a great example and the workforce, workforce shortage in childcare. Yeah, it's an, an issue in Edmonton, it's also an issue in Grand Prairie and Wood Buffalo. And so you could kind of speak to both. I know not every organization is as large as the YMCA of Northern Alberta, but there are certainly smaller organizations that have um, partnerships or know of other organizations in rural or smaller cities that are doing similar work. So to your point, Diane, going into those meetings together could be quite helpful or advocating together. Yeah. And I, and I would say that, you know, there's a real opportunity because what Calgary and Edmonton, and again, I'm speaking generally, but Calgary and Edmonton organizations tend to have more resources. So Calgary and Edmonton can bring more resources to the table and small town and rural organizations can bring, can bring their perspectives and their people and their communities to the table. And if you put those things together, I think you've got a stronger voice and 
and stronger advocacy for this particular government. The other point that I would make, which is a completely different point, but I just want to make it, is that um, you know because of the dynamic political environment we're in, it's really important to spend time with the opposition. And um, you know, I think that it's easy, just as Bob said, it's easy to think, oh, if you meet with the minister, it's all, you know, you've done your job, or in, in fact, it's the staff you need to spend time with. I violently agree with, with, with what you said, um, you know, starting with and working with, you know, junior level staff and frankly, respecting them as much as you respect the minister in, and really respecting them, really, really important. Um, but I think working with the opposition, particularly now, because who the heck knows what the world is going to look like in six months, um, is even more important in this environment than it normally is. No, thank I'm, I'm you. Gonna, sorry, I'm going to pick up on Diane's first point. I think the other thing that rural organizations can do, uh, and we found this um, when, when we were dealing with the Lobbyist Act 15 years ago, and may have to use it again, they have much easier access to the MLA. Yes. Right. They, they run into the MLA in the in the grocery store, in the drugstore, uh, at every local event, and they have more access to tell their story and the impact on their organization in that constituency. And it's when a number of those members arrive at caucus and go in unison, what the hell's going on here, that things actually happen. Absolutely. Okay, we have two questions. I'm going to try to squeeze them in before we wrap up here. One is maybe just right back to the budget when we talk about um, operating supports not keeping pace with inflation. Do you think that this is signaling um, a, a broader strategy from the government to encourage nonprofits to look at mergers in an effort to um, decrease the operational cost burdens? Uh, no, not at all, because I don't think they're that thoughtful um, or that they've actually thought this through to that level of detail. And I know that there's a commission on civil society that's really being thoughtful about this. Now, this, as anyone who's heard me at a CCVO bear pit before knows, I can go on about forever. Um, because I do believe that there need to be artificial constraints to encourage merger, acquisition and exit from the sector. And I'm being all academic because, as you all know, Nonprofits never go away. You lose your grant and you convert to all, all volunteer and the executive director doesn't take a salary and you push just to get a little more grant and you keep going. And there's something to be said for the Schumpeterian creative destruction in the industry that allows us to think about things better. And sometimes you need a little external push from your funders to do that. So I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. That said, I don't think this government is thinking that far down the road at all. Okay, well... And if they are thinking that, then they are woefully misinformed because there is no evidence in any of the literature that mergers save money. Well, of at course not. Best, at best, the literature suggests that it may reduce the rate of increase in expenditure, but there is not going to be a cost saving. So if they're thinking that mergers are the answer, no, I, I think the reason we haven't kept track with inflation is because we have not made it as big an issue for them as we could have. And we have not done a good job of explaining the increased complexity that clients are now presenting with. Yeah, thank you. And that's a conversation. It seems like we had it a lot more at the beginning of the pandemic and it's Nice to hear your voices on it right now. And uh, Nahad, thanks for mentioning the Premier's Council on Civil Society. We know that many of those members are on the call with us today okay. listening. So it's it's great, great to have great them here. Opportunity there. And as critical as many of us can be about the government, you know, I sat down with Mr. Giovanni when he was trying to craft the civil society framework when I was still the mayor. The fact that even they've gone that far, there's some ideological considerations behind that at the beginning. But mm -hmm. there's a real opportunity here, like with the VSI back in the day, Bob, with the Voluntary Sector Initiative, there's a real opportunity to do some recrafting here. And I really do hope that that commission is empowered to have tough conversations and that we are willing and brave enough to have those conversations with them. Yeah, I appreciate that. And it certainly does seem so from, from our perspective. Okay, last question. Um, 
This is a, a GR consultant that had provided some advice to use polling in the public to reach this government. So what are your thoughts on nonprofits engaging in professional polling to engage in the policy conversation? So I'm assuming that's sort of referring to public opinion polling and, and polling of that nature. A, it's pricey. Yeah. B, depending on who's doing it, it may not be reliable. I mean, the, the, the use of panels, um, the reliability depends very much on how reliable, how reflective the panel is. Uh, and we looked at this, the foundation looked at this because we were looking at, could we recreate the talking about charities survey again, which we found to be incredibly useful. And we were not satisfied we could get reliable data. Um, the weighting that is being done is, um, is atrocious. And I mean, as you saw from um, the latest FUFRA that Janet Brown's involved in, context is everything. Um, and and getting, getting the numbers that allow that context to be done is, um, is difficult. What I am finding, and, and my, I invite my colleagues to, to speak about this, what I'm finding on polling and on government consultations is questions that are no longer even pretending to be objective. They are driving you toward a conclusion, um, which makes them even less reliable uh, mm -hmm. and less meaningful. Yeah, the other thing is, and trust me, if you've got lots of money and you can afford to do it, great, create some hype. But polling is such a snapshot. And I think that's kind of what you're saying, right, Bob? It's, And so it's kind of, you might get a headline, you might get some notice, but then it's just kind of a point in time and it goes away. I would suggest a, a greater GR approach would be, you know, actually connecting with members of the public, connecting with people who are directly impacted by your program services difference that you're making. And at least then you have a face to your issue. You have emotion to your issue. We did a lot of this uh, around childcare advocacy um, before the $10 a day announcement came in. Actually having families talk about how I had to quit my job because I couldn't afford childcare. That was much more effective than a poll or a number um, that anybody could, could quote. Mom, mothers Against Drunk Driving and the latest um, moms, um, I can't remember the name, Moms Save Us From Harm that are working for harm reduction. Um, they, very, very effective organizations. As we're in the days gone by, and I'm expecting to see them again soon, the Raging Grannies. I mean, do you remember the Raging Grannies taking on Klein? It's still around. Still here. <laughs> still raging. <laughs> I mean, I would suggest if you have research money to spend, spend it on research to help sharpen your message or create impact or whatever information that you're needing um, that'll have a longer term impact on, on your approach. That would be my thought. Mm -hmm. um, one quick last question. I know I said the last one was the last one, but I think you guys are good. We're going to sneak this one in. So someone is wondering about the balance between transforming and adapting as a, sec as a sector while also ensuring the government appropriately fund nonprofits that are contracted to deliver on GOA mandates to serve vulnerable Al Albertans. So they're curious to hear what you think resonates with government officials to this end and in the community of those that we serve. So are we, are we sort of shoring up our operations to continue our good work or are we transforming and adapting and innovating our way out of the pandemic? And I have an opinion that you cannot innovate your way out of the pandemic, but um, what's resonating with government officials to this end right now? Nobody wants to talk about transformation in, in the next six months. I mean, the, the transformation is all political in the next six months. Um, and when we look at, at, you know, people, somebody was saying to me the other day that, that um, the early learning and child care program was transformational. Well, that transformation was the result of about 30 years of incremental change. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, nobody is good. I don't see something similar to that coming along out of the blue. And yeah. so were I doing a campaign now, I would be saying, I want steady incremental change. And I know what my ultimate goal is. 
And if they catch on to it, that's great too. But I'll take a little piece at a time. And Nahad, I think you were going to jump in, so I'll pass the last word to you. Diane was going. All right, Diane. Um, I think that um, in the short term, you know, this this issue of of staffing and how we actually manage coming out of the pandemic is what we need to be focused on. But I think that it's a it, there's a bit of a it's like it's like you have to do like a short, medium, and long term plan, right? If you kind of think about it that way. And so when you're talking to government about the short term and immediate needs coming out of COVID recovery and the funding that, ev that, we, that everyone needs to deal with real issues that are happening today, I think you can use those conversations to really start to seed the need for longer term transformation. So Bob, maybe I disagree with you a little bit. I wouldn't not talk about it at all, but I think it's a question of you know what's your what what's the what's your main point that you need to deal with now and then how do you embed and seed some of the future need for change because i think there is a long term need for 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 change perfect well i think that's a great note to end it on if we're if we're happy with that now i'm going to thank you guys profusely in a second but before i do um, we had a really excellent suggestion that we invite everyone on the call today to turn on their cameras so we can see each other because it has been so long and wave at each other and, you know, reach through the screen. So hi, everybody. Great, great, great to see you. And thank you to our star panel today, Michelle Heinz Dawson, Diane Kenyon, Nahed Nenti and Bob Wyatt. Our sector and communities are made stronger and better through your leadership and contributions. And we are so grateful for the time you've spent with us here today. So thank you all. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you to Kirsten Bowden and the team at CCBO working behind the scenes today and every day. Marissa Barber, Mary Polly Cronus, Alexa Briggs, Megan Dornstadter, and Mike Dzinski. We love hearing from you. Please take a moment and complete our short survey that will pop back right after this session today. And in case you don't get a chance to share your feedback, check your inbox for the survey and links to great reads and more information on today's topic. So we couldn't bring you the Nonprofit Connection Series without the great support from our friends at ATB Financial. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Awesome bank, worth checking out. If you're not already banking with them, why not? and our supporters that make work like our budget deep dive possible every single day. I am really looking forward to our event in June to welcome you in person to meet with Mayor Gondet and members of City Council and to reconnect with each other in the amazing Caria Village Common Space. It's a beautiful new community space. We'll look forward to inviting you back to join us there in person in June. Link is in the chat. Thank you again to everyone who attended today and for all that you do every single day. Please take a moment to complete the short survey. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and we hope you can join us again soon. Bye for now.